All right, how's it going? Welcome back to another video here in the series on group theory. So far, we have been working for a couple of videos now on this section here called quotient groups. And conceptually, what we've been doing is sort of building up the tools that we need to, to talk about this, this sort of all important theorem that shows up in, in, in group theory called the isomorphism theorem. And if, if you haven't been able to tell by the, the title of the video, that is what this video is going to be about. We are finally ready to say, let's take some of the tools that we've been learning. Let's, let's take these normal subgroups and then quotient groups, combine those and, and really combine some of the results from, from earlier on in, in the video series as well, all into one very useful, very applicable theorem called the isomorphism theorem. So, so that's, that's what the goal is going to be for, for today's video. It's, it's going to be first to introduce what is the isomorphism theorem and then to, to go through a couple of examples of applying it so we can see, okay, that's, that is how we can use it. And we can kind of see that because it's so general and it, it ties together, as, as we'll see in a second, it ties together different groups and it ties together homomorphisms kind of all into one statement. Uh, there's a, we see that there are a lot of connections that, that can be made that we, we may not have initially thought uh, could be established. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. But before we, we get into, into really just saying this is the isomorphism theorem, I, I was saying at the end of the last video that there is this, this quick result that I wanted to uh, write down at, at the end of the video, but, but then I was like, maybe I should save it for the beginning of this video. And then as I was as I was going back through the videos, because sometimes there's a bit of a, a gap in between videos, I don't always remember exactly what I cover every single time. I'm not always just going back to rewatch these, right? <laughs> and I realized we already covered this, this sort of mini result that I wanted to talk about, but I thought that it could, it could still be useful just to, to cover it again because it's going to be relevant. And it'll also be good as a kind of a, a practice exercise for, for you guys too, to see, do we remember how to establish this result? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first write this thing that we've already seen, but uh, I'm going to write it again on the board and we're going to go through proving it. But maybe this time I would say to, to try proving it yourself first and seeing how far you can get. And then if, if, if you can get it, that's, that's great. And then if you get stuck, then we'll show how to, how to go through the proof. Okay, so this is the, the claim that I want to establish, and, and we'll see as soon as we actually state what the isomorphism theorem is, why this is going to be important, but let's just uh, go through this one more time. It says that every kernel is a normal subgroup, and, and hopefully to the, if, uh, you could pause the video and try it yourself, but, but we're going to actually go through the proof now. So first thing that we want to do, let's just remind ourselves what it means to be a normal subgroup, right? So if we have a group G and then a normal subgroup K of G, and, and now it's almost like K is conveniently uh, named, right? Because K can represent the kernel. Then we know that K is going to be a normal subgroup of G if the quantity, AKA inverse, is an element of K, right? Where A is some arbitrary it can be any element of the group, and then little k can be any element of the normal subgroup, which in this case is going to be the kernel. So, so this is what we would what we'd like to show, right? Now, a, a kernel though, it's not just sort of this arbitrary subgroup, right? It's it, it belongs to a specific function. It belongs to a homomorphism, right? So, what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to define a homomorphism f. Maybe it goes from g into h. And then we can define this, this element, little a, that is an element of G, all right? And what we would like to do is, is we would like to show that if, if, well, we'd like to show this condition ideally right here though, right? But, but what, what does this condition mean? Basically, if this quantity, AKA inverse, is in K, the, the kernel, what that tells us is that if F our function of the homomorphism were to act on this quantity, then we should get the identity element in the codomain. That's what it means to be an element of the kernel, right? So in other words, we would like to show that f of aka inverse is equal to the identity element e sub h in the codomain. 
So if we can establish that this quantity is, is true, that's just another way of saying this condition is, is satisfying, which is really what we're trying to show, right? So, so let's, let's see how to, how to do that. First thing that we can do, hopefully we're familiar with, with this property of, of homomorphisms, and maybe I'll just write it up here real quickly, is that if we have f of x dot y, and f is a homomorphism, that is going to equal f of x times f of y, right? And in, this was kind of the fundamental property that homomorphisms needed to have, but, but this was specifically for, for two inputs, x and y. But we could, of course, generalize this to any number of inputs. So like if we had f of x, y, z, that would be the same thing as f of x times f of y times f of z. And we can do the same thing right here. f of a, k, a inverse can simply be rewritten as f of a, f of k, f of a inverse. And ideally, we'd like to show that it equals the identity element in the codomain. Right? So just referring to kind of the fundamental property of a homomorphism. Now, let's, let's try to simplify this quantity right here. First of all, A, let's look at the first term, F of A. A is just an arbitrary element of the group. So when F acts on A, we, we don't know the specifics because it's, it's so general, so we can't do anything with this quantity yet. So we still have our F of A right here. Now, if we were to go to F of K, Let's remind ourselves what k is. k is an element of the kernel. And if it's an element of the kernel, that says that when f acts on k, we get the identity element in the codomain. So this quantity right here, because k is in the kernel, must equal f of a times e sub h. And then for the final element, f of a inverse, one of the fundamental properties that we learned about when talking about homomorphisms is that inverse elements will map to inverse elements. And to, just to explicitly state what that means, I'll, I'll write it over here. If we have f of a inverse, that is going to be the same thing as f inverse of a. So we could, we could use this property from, from homomorphisms and, and to rewrite this quantity right here, say this is f inverse of a equals e sub h. And then hopefully it makes sense how everything cancels out from here. F of A times the identity is just F of A. So then we have F of A times F inverse of A. And basically it's, it's, this is, uh, if this is a little bit confusing, we can just think of the notation F of A as just some way of describing a codomain element. Uh, because right, it's, it takes in some element from the domain A and it maps it to some element in the codomain F of A. So this is just some, some long way of describing some codomain element. So we have a codomain element times the inverse of that same element. So any element times its inverse is just going to give us the identity, and therefore every kernel is going to be a normal subgroup. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense, and we're going to see in a second that this is going to be very useful when we're talking about the isomorphism theorem. Now, I, I feel like I've... I've been keeping everybody in suspense long enough, we want to actually write out what is this isomorphism theorem that we've been trying to build up for several videos now. So let me actually write it out. We're going to go through the proof and, and really lay it all out next. Okay, so we have arrived at the really the main theorem of the section, the isomorphism theorem. Let's go through it together. So it says, let F, which maps from G and H, be a group homomorphism with a kernel K. Then two things that, that we can say. First is the result that we just established, which is that K is a normal subgroup of G. And second is this isomorphism right here, which is really kind of the main content of, of what we think of when, when we think of the isomorphism, which is that this quotient group, G slash K, is isomorphic to the image of F. All right, and maybe I'll just underline this right here to kind of say this is the main thing that people think of when they think of the isomorphism theorem. Now, I should also mention too that 
I'm calling this the isomorphism theorem, but technically, if, if you were to look up the isomorphism theorem, you'll see that this is the first isomorphism theorem. There are other isomorphism theorems, like the second and the third, and stuff like that, but, but this is kind of the, the, the main one that we're gonna be focusing on, at least for this video series. So, but I just wanted to, to mention that in case you wanted to look this up, it, it would be considered the first isomorphism theorem for groups, would be kind of the, the full, full sentence for the theorem. But anyways, let's, let's go through proving this. So, what we can do is, because we've already established the first result, that if F has a kernel K, and F's a homomorphism, we know that the kernel is going to be a normal subgroup. That's what we just showed. So what we really need to show is, is this isomorphism right here. And the strategy that we're gonna to use to do that is to show that if these two groups are isomorphic, then there will exist an isomorphism between them. That kind of makes sense, right? In other words, there exists a bijective homomorphism that exists between the two, two groups. So first, we're just going to say, what is this thing that is supposedly a bijective homomorphism? And right now, it's just going to be this arbitrary function. And the, the lecture notes call it theta. You can call it whatever you want. And naturally, if, if this is ideally going to be an isomorphism between the two, it would make sense that the domain and the codomain are these two groups right here. So theta is going to be a function which takes in elements from the domain, which we're gonna call uh, this quotient group, G slash K, and it's gonna map them to elements of this codomain, the image of F. And admittedly, this, this might get slightly confusing if we're not careful of, of what's going on, because there are gonna be two different homomorphisms that are, that are floating around in the picture here. And it's just important that we, we keep track of this. The first one is this, this function f, and that is going to be, we, we can think about the, this function f as kind of the, the function that we actually will see in real problems, right? If, if there is some homomorphism in, in a problem, they're talking about this guy f. There's another thing, another function, theta, which we're gonna see is a homomorphism, but theta is really just a tool, we're gonna to use it as a mechanism to show that, G, that these two groups are equal to each other. But this is more of the, the thing that actually gets used, and this is sort of just for this proof, okay? And they're different functions, of course. Yeah. Now, first thing is, I, I said that, that theta maps from here to here. Specifically what theta does is if theta were to act on an element of the domain, or an element of this quotient group, then it will, map to some element of the codomain. Now let's ask ourselves again, what, is it, what are the elements of the quotient group? And those are just left cosets, right? So if, if I have an element A and G and in the overall group G, then I can define a left coset if K is a normal subgroup, A K like this. And so this is gonna take in this domain element and it's gonna map it to some codomain element and we're gonna call that codomain element F of A, right? Because again, any element of the codomain is, is an element, or it, it, I should say the, the codomain here is the image, the, the codomain of theta is the image of F, right? Ho ho that makes sense, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> um, it's tough to gauge it if, if that makes sense. I, I hope that makes sense, all right? This is the output set. So uh, the elements from the image of F are simply going to be, maybe let me just explicitly write this out to make sure that this is not too confusing here. The image of F, and then I'll erase this, is simply going to be the set of elements in the codomain of F, so the elements in H, set of like H and H, such that F of A equals H. In other words, the elements in the codomain that get mapped to from the domain, all right? So, it's, so all of the elements in the image of F are going to look something, they're gonna have this form, F of something, some element in the domain of F, okay? What, what I'm trying to say with all this too is, is, is that, that this form, 
when I write this out, this is to denote a general element in the image of f or the codomain of theta. Okay. So uh, this is the function that, that we have defined. And the, the first thing that we would like to do with, with r really any function is to show that it is not just defined, but it is a well-defined function. And let's just remind ourselves again what it means to be well-defined. If a function theta is going to be well-defined, what that means is if I have two elements from the domain of theta that are the same, in other words, if I have maybe two left cosets that are equal to each other like this, that should imply that the corresponding elements in the codomain are also the same. In other words, that should imply that theta of ak equals theta of bk. And before we can even show that like theta is an isomorphism, we gotta show that it's first a well-defined function. And again, this is more practice with, with just showing this property, but, but this would be how we would show that a function is well-defined. So let's, let's establish this result first. This would be our starting condition that we're provided. Uh, we're supposing that AK and BK are the same left coset. And what we could do is we could take this equation, multiply B over to the left, and we would get that B inverse A K equals K, right? And what this tells us is that if we take the quantity B inverse times A times some element of, of K, some element of the kernel of F, but, but some element of, of this group right here, that will equal some other element of this group right here. And another way of establishing this condition, and I believe we've already talked about this uh, in, in a previous video, but another way of, of saying this, this uh, equation right here is to say that the quantity B inverse A is simply an element of K. And maybe if that's still confusing, I'd, I'd recommend trying just specific examples with, with small groups to show that, that this would, would be true. But anyways, you can go from here and then you can get to this result right here. And, and now let's just ask ourselves, what does this mean? If B inverse times A is in K, well, well, K is going to be the kernel, but the kernel of what? It's gonna be the kernel of the kind of the realistic function, the function that, actually, that we actually see in problems. It's gonna be the kernel of F. So that tells us something. If B inverse A is in the kernel of F, that, that tells us that if we were to take f and act it on this quantity, maybe I'll do this right here, we're gonna take f and act it on b inverse of a. This is an element of the domain of f. That should map to the identity element in h, the codomain of f. So that should map to e sub h. And now we just go through similar ideas or go through similar steps to what we were doing in the previous whiteboard, where we can rewrite this as f of b inverse f of a equals e of h. We can move the inverse kind of to the outside because inverse is mapped to inverses. So f of b inverse is the same as f inverse of b. And then we can just multiply f inverse of b over to the, the other side to get that f of a equals f of b times the identity or just f of b by itself. And, and now we're essentially done here because we should, we should remind ourselves this is the condition we're trying to show. We started with ak equals bk and we want to show that theta of ak equals theta of bk. Well, well what is theta of ak? It was defined as theta of ak is f of a. So f of a is the same thing as theta of ak and then similarly how would f of b, b, how would f of b be defined? <laughs> that would just simply be theta of bk if we replace the a right here with the letter b. So we have theta of ak equals theta of bk. And now that we've established that, that tells us that the function theta, at least, well, that theta, this thing that we kind of arbitrarily defined, at least is a well-defined function. Takes care of step number one. Now, we still have more work to do, right? We need to show that theta ideally is an isomorphism to show that these groups here are isomorphic. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to erase probably just this part of the board, and then we'll go through the rest of the proof down with the, the remaining whiteboard space that, that we have. 
All right, now to, to show that this function theta is actually an isomorphism. First thing to, to show that it is an isomorphism is that we need to show that it is a homomorphism, right? And to, to do that, we would need to show that theta times a product of inputs, or in other words, ak times bk, is equal to theta acting on these individually, or in other words, a product of outputs, theta of ak times theta of bk, like this. Now let's just see how, how we can simplify this. This is what we'd like to show, ideally. Now, first, when we have ak multiplying bk, we have to remember what this, this multiplication means. That is the binary operation that gets applied in the domain. Or in other words, the binary operation for the quotient group. So let's just ask ourselves, what is that binary operation for the quotient group? And we talked about it in the last video, but this product right here is the same thing as, as combining these together and having a new coset as the output of AK times BK, and it's just going to be AB times K. All right, that, that's, that's what it means to take AK times BK if we're working in the quotient group. So that's going to be the, the left-hand side, and then for the, the right-hand side, we can sort of just simplify each of these two terms based off of how theta right here is defined. So theta of AK is going to equal F of A, and then same thing with, with theta of bk. That's just going to be f of b, like this. And then last step that we can do is, is we can say, well, if, if theta of ak is f of a, what is theta of abk? Well, it's just going to be f of ab, right? So this quantity right here is equal to f of ab. And now we see that f of a, b is equal to f of a times f of b. And we know that that must be true simply because we were told in the beginning of the problem that f is going to be a group homomorphism. So f inherently must satisfy this property that f of a, b equals f of a times f of b. And because f is a homomorphism, that in turn now allows us to say that the other function theta is a homomorphism. Okay, so, so that's kind of the first step in, in, in showing that theta's isomorphism is, is this property saying, okay, it's at least a homomorphism, right? But that's, that's still not, not complete, right? In order to show that it is an isomorphism, we need to show that this homomorphism theta is bijective. In other words, it is both injective and surjective. So we, we need to show both of those two requirements, and then finally we can uh, say we are done, right? So, so let's maybe start, it doesn't matter which one we do first, but let's start with the injective requirement. If we want to show that theta is injective, what that, what, that, what that means, I'm trying to say what that means is that if we have two elements from the codomain that are equal, in other words, if we have theta of ak equals theta of bk, that should imply that the two corresponding elements in the domain are equal. In other words, ak equals bk like this and notice this is really just like the it's like we swapped statements for the conditions for what it means to be well defined and it's it's kind of nice because we can almost just work backwards with the same steps that we did when we were showing that theta was well defined but we'll, we'll still go through it anyways but just know that the logic is essentially the same so what we can do here is we can say that if theta, this is our starting statement now, two elements of the codomain are equal. So if theta of ak is equal to theta of bk, we can multiply both sides by the inverse of this quantity. And we're going to get that theta inverse of bk times theta of ak equals the identity element in the image of f. Well, I'll just write e, just say that it should equal the identity, right? And then what we can do is, is we can uh, effectively combine these together, or we should pro probably first just move the inverse to the inside, because inverse is mapped to inverses, right? So theta inverse of bk is the same thing as theta of b inverse k, like this. 
And now we know that theta is a homomorphism. We just showed that. So we can combine these two together to say that this is the same thing as theta of b inverse k times a k equals e. And then we just say, okay, how do these elements interact? Well, b inverse k times a k is just b inverse a times k. All right, so, so another way of combining the, the, the two terms inside the parentheses, that would be this expression right here. We'd have theta of b inverse times a times k equals e. And then we ask ourselves, what is another way of writing this? We have an element in the domain of theta. And when theta acts on this left coset right here, we get the identity element in the codomain. So, so this tells us that b inverse a times k, a times k, is in the kernel of theta. Notice it's not the kernel of f because, because the, the, uh, the, the kernel of f are the set of elements in g, whereas the, the kernel of theta are the set of elements in g slash k. And this is why we want to be very conscious of, of the two different functions that we're working with here. But this condition, and, and maybe just take a minute to just look at this equation by itself. Say we have theta acting on some domain element going to the identity in the codomain. That's what it means for this domain element to be a part of the kernel of whatever this function is right here. Okay, so, so hopefully that makes sense. And once we're here, we can then basically ask ourselves, uh, okay, what is, the, what is another way of writing out the, the kernel of theta, right? And, and the, the, another way of writing the kernel of theta, and hopefully this makes sense, is that, maybe let me just go through a specific example. If rather than having theta act on a, an arbitrary left coset, theta of ak, let's have theta just act on e of k, this convenient element. We know that there are this convenient left coset right here. This is the identity element times our normal subgroup. One thing that we know about homomorphisms is that theta will, or if we have a homomorphism, it will take the identity element and map it to the corresponding identity element. So theta of ek is going to equal whatever the identity element is in the codomain. So what this, another way of writing theta of e of k is to simply just say k by itself, right? We always said that e of k can just be written as k. And what I'm trying to get at here is, is that this tells us that if theta of k gives us the identity, another way of writing the kernel of theta, because that's what this is right here, another way of writing the kernel of theta is simply to write k, because right? that's kind of what, what k is. Right? So, so another way of saying b, what I'm trying to say is that another way of saying b inverse a times k is in the kernel is to replace the kernel with the uppercase letter k. And then we, we, we mentioned when we were going through the, the well-defined part of this, that another way of writing this, and it's the final step, so we're almost there, is that ak equals bk. And, and that's, again, that, that's what we were trying to show, right? What it means to be injective is that theta, if theta ak equals theta bk, then ak equals bk. We started with this condition, theta of ak equals theta of bk, and we ended up with just ak equals bk. Therefore, theta, this homomorphism, is an injective homomorphism. Now, the final thing that we need to do is to show that it is also surjective, okay? So let me just erase this, and, and because the proof for the surjective part is so short, I won't bother, I guess, uh, I'll, I'll just talk while I erase is what I'm trying to say. So let, let's keep in mind what it means to be surjective. A, a function that is surjective will have every element in the codomain get mapped to at least one time, meaning it gets mapped to one time or more than one time. Another way of saying that is that the image 
of theta, uh, being the, the elements that get mapped to from here, is the entire codomain. And, and that's just what it means to, that's just another way of, of describing any surjective function, that the image of your function is equal to whatever its codomain is. Okay. So, so this is a condition that what I'm about to write right now, that the image of this function is equal to whatever its codomain is. So the image of theta is equal to the image of f. This is what it would mean for theta to be a surjective function. And it might look a little weird too, right? Because we have these two images. It just so happens that the image of f is the codomain of theta, right? So, so that's, it has nothing to do with, with two images necessarily being equal. Image of function equals codomain is the general condition. Now, all we have to do from here is say, well, well let's think about what is this, this uh, group that, that we're working with? What does it look like if we were to write out its elements? And if we were to just look at the image of theta, that's going to be the set of elements from the codomain. In other words, let's write this. The image of theta, I just wrote image. <laughs> the image of theta is going to be the set of elements from the codomain, or the set of elements that look like f of a, such that they got mapped to from the domain. Or in other words, such that when theta acts on a k, we get f of a, like this, right? So, so this is what it means to have the, the, the image of theta. But, but if we, we look at this, hopefully it, it makes sense that if the image of theta is all of the elements of the form f of a, that's, that's what the image of f is. This would be another way that we could write out the image of f. So because these two groups contain the exact same elements, therefore the image of theta is equal to its codomain, making theta a surjective function. And to now tie it all together, because theta is well, theta is well defined, it is a homomorphism, which is injective and surjective. Therefore, theta is an isomorphism between g slash k and the image of f, making g slash k isomorphic to the image of f. That's the isomorphism theorem. Okay. Now, a lot of stuff to process, right? But, but again, this is the main punchline. This is the statement that we want to have in our heads going forwards. And for, for the rest of the video, what we're going to be doing is, is simply taking this statement right here, applying it to a couple of examples to see how we can use the, the isomorphism theorem. So I'm going to erase the board and then we're going to go through those examples to finish off the video. Okay, so first example that we're going to work with is going to be looking at a function which maps from this group into this group, where the, the domain group here is the set of real numbers under addition, and the codomain group is going to be C star, which is going to be a set of complex numbers, but just without the number zero, under uh, multiplication. And the reason why we're emitting zero is because the set of complex numbers by itself does not form a group under multiplication because zero times anything is zero, but one should be the identity element. So we need to omit zero from the complex numbers in order to, to, to form a group. Now, we're gonna have this function right here, f, and what it's specifically gonna do is if it takes in a real number, maybe I'll call it r for real number, it will map to some corresponding element e to the i 2 pi r. So this is the action of, of f. this is what f does on a real number. And what we'd like to do is, is to, to first show that f is a homomorphism. And once we know that f is a homomorphism, we can establish some immediate results using the isomorphism theorem. So let's, let's go through that first. But we wanna first show that f is, is, a, is a homomorphism and to do that, we'd like to show, of course, that maybe f of r1 times r2 equals f of r1 times f of r2, All right? Now, 
let's let's keep in mind what these operations are though here, right? Because R1 times R2 simply means to apply the binary operation on these two real numbers. But notice that the binary operation specified in this example is addition. So rather than multiplication, the literal operation we're going to be performing is addition. Whereas in the codomain, the literal operation we're going to be performing is multiplication. Okay, And let, let's just see how, how this plays out here. So on the left-hand side, f of r1 plus r2 is simply just going to, by this rule right here, map to e to the i2 pi times r1 plus r2, like this. So that's the left-hand side. And then for the right-hand side, f of r1 is going to be e to the i2 pi r1 multiplied by e to the i2 pi r2. And hopefully we know that if, if we have uh, two exponents with the same base, what we can do is just combine them into a single exponent where we end up adding the, or a single exponential where we add the two exponents together, right? So this is i2 pi, and then in parentheses, r1 plus r2, and, and that's what we have right here. So because that's satisfied, this property is satisfied, we know that f is a homomorphism. And that's, that's really good, right? Uh, uh, or at least uh, to, for, for the example that we're trying to show, this is good. Because now, what can we immediately say about this function f? And what are some statements we can make relating these groups using the isomorphism theorem? Well, first, the, the first result from the isomorphism theorem is that the kernel of f, and maybe to be more specific, I should just write, the kernel of f is a normal subgroup of, of r+. plus. So what we can first ask ourselves is, okay, well, what is the kernel of this, this function right here? In other words, what are the set of real numbers, which when we apply f to them, in other words, we plug them into here, give us the identity element or the number one in the codomain. And, and hopefully we know this is this e to the i2 pi r. This, is, this can be simplified using Euler's identity as cosine 2 pi r plus i sine 2 pi r, right? Good old Euler's identity. And in order to get the number one as the output right here, this term would be going to zero and this term would end up, we would need the imaginary part to go to zero and the real part to go to one. And that's going to occur when, uh, whenever r is just some integer, right? Because any integer multiple of two pi, when we apply the cosine to that, gives us the number one. So that tells us that the kernel of f is, is simply going to be the set of all integers. So, so maybe let's write, let's write that out. The kernel of f is the set of all integers under uh, addition. And from the isomorphism theorem, we immediately know then, and we can immediately establish that this group is a normal subgroup of real numbers under addition. So that's kind of the first thing that it tells us, which is kind of nice. We have this group and we can immediately establish a normal subgroup, so not just any subgroup, a normal subgroup. And the, But more importantly, the way that we did that was just simply by looking at the kernel of a function, a very different method than anything that we've been doing prior to that. Before we would be checking all of the group axioms, this is a much more compact way of finding a normal subgroup. But that's not all we can say, right? Because, of course, the main content of the first isomorphism theorem is, is, is to say that g slash k is isomorphic to the image of that. That's what we want to use next. So, so now we're kind of just going to plug in each of the pieces into this, this uh, isomorphic expression right here, where g is going to be uh, this group. Or in other words, and, and maybe just to be more compact, I'll just write r and then I'll write z for g and k. So the left-hand side is going to be r slash z. So this is some quotient group right here, r slash z. And the first, the first thing is that it, it forms a group, but we would immediately know that it is going to be isomorphic to the image of this function right here. And then let's just ask ourselves, what is the image of 
of this function? Well, it's going to be the set of complex numbers that get mapped to by here. And hopefully we are familiar with, with complex numbers and that this can be kind of thought of as writing a complex number out in modulus argument form, where the modulus is simply the number one. But, but it could take in essentially any argument. So, so this, the, the image of this function, and I think if, if there's some uncertainty about it, try just plotting this out for a couple values yourself, and I think you'll see that this is true. But, but the image of this function is simply going to be values of this form, which end up forming the unit circle. Right? You could have this be the number one, this is zero, so you'd have, I hope I'm not over explaining this, you would have one zero, when this is uh, negative one, this would also be zero, so you'd have this point. Conversely, when this is zero, you would have either plus i or minus i. So on the, the complex plane, this would be the, the unit circle. And one way that we can denote the unit circle is simply, I want to make sure that uh, I use the same notation that they do, okay, yeah, they use that, is with s and a subscript one, where this is, is simply a compact way of, of describing the, the, the unit circle. So the unit circle under multiplication is the image of that function, and we immediately know that not only does this form a group, which we probably, uh, we, we could think of, but maybe we would not have initially thought of, but we now know that it is isomorphic to this group right here, a connection that we may or may not have seen right away. And in other words, these two groups have the exact same properties. Okay. So this is how we can use the, the isomorphism theorem. I'm going to go through one more example, kind of just a similar thing, just to show how we can apply it, and then we'll, we'll call it for this video. All right, and then to, to finish off the video, just one more example that I want to go through. And I'll mention too, if, if these symbols look a little bit unfamiliar, the, these are uh, concepts from linear algebra. So if, if you're not familiar with linear algebra, that's why I had the last example, but I, I really want to encourage people to, to learn about linear algebra. And I'm making a, a simultaneous playlist on or a video series on linear algebra on the, the channel. So I wanted to include an example because I really think a lot of the concepts between the two subjects overlap a lot, and I want to highlight those whenever possible. So if you haven't worked with, with linear algebra, no worries, uh, you got all the main stuff, but, but if, if you are familiar with linear algebra, let's, let's go through one more example. So now the function that is in question, uh, f, is going to map from a domain called a GLN of R, and this is the general linear group and what it represents in case we are unfamiliar with it it is going to be the set of invertible matrices and specifically invertible well well in order to be invertible you got to be a square matrix uh, so this is going to be the set of invertible n by n matrices matrices <laughs> where the elements of that matrix come from this field right here which would be the set of real numbers this is a fancy way of simply saying the set of invertible n by n real matrices. So that's the domain. Every element is itself a matrix. And it will map to a codomain R star, which is going to use the same notation as in the previous example. I wrote this to be compact, but, but really we could say this is a set of real numbers without the number zero under the addition or the, the operation of multiplication. And so that's what the domain and codomain are. And then the, the function, what it does, is it's going to take in an invertible matrix and map, map it to the corresponding determinant of that matrix. Now, first thing that we would want to do is, obviously, we're going to, if we're working with the isomorphism theorem, we kind of are implying that this is inherently a homomorphism, but we want to show that too, right? So what we'd like to show is that if f of, if we have f of a dot b, that should equal f of a times f of b, right? And if we apply what, what f is on both sides of the equation, this just gives us the determinant 
of A times B on the left hand side, and on the right hand side we get the determinant of A times the determinant of B. And this example is somewhat nice because multiplication is the operation, or is the binary operation of both of these groups here. So it's, it's as straightforward as this. And then hopefully if we're familiar with determinants, we're aware of the fact that this is one of the fundamental properties of determinants, right? That, that um, they act in this way when, when you take the determinant of a product of matrices. So that's good, right? That tells us that F is a homomorphism. And, and from that, we can say, all right, now let's just apply the isomorphism theorem. And notice that's all we need to do in order to apply the isomorphism theorem. Just find a homomorphism, and then we can immediately just start rattling off a bunch of results. So first thing, let's, let's take the first part of the, the isomorphism theorem and find the kernel of this function. Well, the kernel of this function is going to be the set of elements in the domain that map to the identity in the codomain. And because the operation we're working with is multiplication, the identity element in the codomain is the number one. So we want to find the set of matrices that have a determinant of one. Another way of, or I guess a way of compactly describing that set of matrices that is, uh, has its own name because it's so common, that is known as the special linear group, so SLN of R. And again, in words, this, sim this simply says the set of n by n matrices with real coefficients, and the set of invertible n by n matrices with real coefficients, and the S part implies that the determinant of those matrices is the number one. So we have SLN of R as the kernel, and immediately because it's the kernel, we know that SLN of R is a normal subgroup of GLN of R. So you can immediately make these, these connections between various matrix groups in, instantaneously through the isomorphism theorem. It's really nice, honestly. <laughs> you don't have to go through all these axioms, right? So, so that would be the first step. And then the, the second step is to say, okay, once, once we have this, what is the corresponding quotient group isomorphic to? Let's first write out the quotient group from the first place. The, the quotient group is going to be the domain GLN of R. So GLN of R divided by or backslash the, the, the kernel, which is going to be SLN of R. Like this. So this is a quotient group and it's going to be isomorphic to whatever the, the image of this function is. So then all we say is, okay, well, what, what is the, the image of this function? And hopefully it makes sense that the image is simply going to be the entire codomain. And, and, and let's see why. What, what I could do is let's say that I have some, some element of my codomain, which is just going to be some real number that's not zero. And I'm going to call it lambda. I can write out so I have some lambda in R star. To show that every one of these real numbers gets mapped to, I can, all I have to do is show that there's a matrix that has a determinant. Or for every value of lambda, there's a corresponding matrix that has lambda as its determinant. And that matrix, I mean, there are multiple examples that you can come up with, but probably the most straightforward one is if you have whatever the value of lambda is in the one, one element, and then you just have a bunch of ones, one, 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 along the rest of the main diagonal, and it's a diagonal matrix, so all of the off-diagonal elements are zero. In the case where this matrix, we can call it A, is a diagonal matrix, then the determinant is simply the product of the, the values along the main diagonal, so this would be lambda times one times one times one, n uh, times or I should say n minus one factors of one times lambda, which, which is just lambda. Point of me, me saying all this is that no, no matter what element we have in the codomain, I can construct a matrix whose determinant is that value. So I know that the codomain or the image is simply going to be R star under multiplication. And now we have the, these two different groups right here, but, but notice that they, they would look inherently different because the, the left group, it's, it's a quotient group that would be a product of matrices. So, so this is a group of matrices, whereas this is a group of real numbers. 
And groups of matrices and real numbers may initially seem very different, but we're showing immediately through the isomorphism theorem that they have the exact same properties. Like that, going back to that chess analogy, it's like the exact same uh, game of chess, but maybe the, the, the chess boards look different, the pieces look different. But yeah, this, this is how we can apply the isomorphism theorem. So hopefully uh, we, we can see just the immediateness of, of some of the results that we can use and, and we can use this as soon as we know that we have a homomorphism. It's, it's really nice and it's really powerful and we're gonna be using it throughout the rest of the, the video series. But yeah, that's that's gonna be it for this video. Uh, I, I Just to finish this off too, sorry that the, the uploads have been a little bit slower than I would like. Sometimes uh, life gets in the way and you get a little bit busier, but I am still trying to keep the schedule of uploading once or twice a week. So I uh, don't plan on stopping that. It's, it's, it's slowed down a little bit, but, but we're still gonna, uh, the, the goal I should say is to finish the group theory video series as well as the linear algebra video series by the end of the, the 2023 year. But anyways, that, that's, that's all I have for this video. Uh, thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.